Holcomb Tower stands high on the hill above Hazelhurst School, a primary school situated in the heart of Lancashire. This is the apparatus is dispersed and ready for the lesson to begin. On this occasion, the children have been asked to choose any kind of small apparatus from their tray or basket and to practice quite freely with it. This instruction has been given whilst the children are changing to enable the lesson to begin without delay. For several lessons, the teacher will have begun the lesson in this way but he will have encouraged the children to choose the same apparatus and he will have stimulated them the apparatus they have selected in as many different ways as possible. In addition, he can stimulate variations within the same type of movement and ultimately these are combined into a pattern or sequence. A pattern being a series of movements combined effectively so that one movement flows imperceptibly into the next. Let's follow Jean. She moves in, out, over, and across her hoop on different parts of her body. These movements have been combined into a pattern or sequence, which demands thought and understanding. The opportunity to create patterns becomes possible with all kinds of apparatus. And whilst the children are practicing, the teacher will move around the class, guiding, helping, and encouraging individual children and sometimes stimulating the class as a whole. Repetition This is a feature of learning and we must allow the children the opportunity to repeat and to consolidate from one lesson to the next. The teacher will stimulate and encourage better quality in the work or greater variety and greater variety from each child. The teaching techniques of demonstration and observation contribute greatly to these ends. To make children versatile and adaptable with all kinds of apparatus, versatile with their bodies too, is one of the aims of this work. The teacher will resort to such phrases as, how can you vary this? How else can you use your body or your apparatus? Can you combine the different movements you have discovered into a pattern? Note that each pattern, like each child, is different in some way. Another way of beginning the lesson is to allow the children to practice freely without apparatus. In this indirect method of presentation, where the children enjoy considerable freedom, the teacher must stimulate variety to offset the danger of children continually repeating the same movement or activity. The idea of pattern is one way of achieving this. At a later stage, further progress can be obtained by allowing the children to work with a partner and here we see an example of two girls cooperating in different ways. Taking, transferring, and moving a partner's body weight, matching movements of different kinds, and again with a variation of speed. Let's follow them again and realize that this sequence, this pattern, has been devised by these two girls and not by the teacher. Imposing a task or limitation upon the class is yet another way of beginning the lesson. And here the children are creating patterns based upon the one idea of making bridge-like body shapes. Initially, the teacher will ask the class 
to make one bridge-like shape, but later encourages each child to solve the task in other ways. It is at this stage that real experimentation takes place, and later patterns based on this idea will be developed. Follow Elsie in her pattern. Moving from one part of her body to another, she shows great control and understanding of what her body is doing. She can repeat these movements at will. Her work demonstrates how this method, this approach to the teaching of physical education, develops fully the potential ability of each child. Each child is stimulated to give the best of which he or she is capable, the best in terms of effort and achievement. And now we turn to that phase of the lesson which deals with running, jumping and landing. In the early stage, the jumping and landing will be quite free, but the teacher will stimulate and demand better quality, lightness, resilience, height and control. Further development is obtained by additional movements on landing, as well as variation in the jumps themselves. Individual mats are not only a substitute for the inadequate floor surfaces we might have to contend with, but they also serve as a focal point, round and over which the child can move, thus enriching the scope of the work. The children are encouraged to practice as soon as their mats are placed on the ground. This practice can be entirely free, but on other occasions he can impose a task or limitation upon the class. The limitation may be prepositional, over, round, on, or along, relative to the mat itself. It may be based on a body shape or a type of body movement, such as stretching, curling, or twisting. It may be prompted by working on a particular part of the body. Or again, the task could be a combination of movements involving all or some of these ideas. Dorothy's work shows this, but it should be remembered that she will have had the opportunity to repeat, to improve, and to develop her pattern over several lessons. Here we show another variation of jumping practices, this time over small apparatus, over the individual mat. All kinds of variations are possible, and again, other movements can be added, but the children must be ready for this stage. Further progress can be obtained through the principle of analysis, and just as jumping is one way of moving over the mat, the children can be given the opportunity to discover other ways of moving over their apparatus. And now the task is rolling and rocking on different parts of the body. A variation of shape, long, wide and curled shapes, a variation of speed, and often a variation in direction. When children have discovered the many variations which are possible, they are then encouraged to combine these variations into a pattern or sequence of movement.
A slow movement in Janet, a quicker one, a variation in shape. And over several lessons, the teacher, as in all aspects of the lesson, will stimulate as great variety as possible from each individual child. Now the class work on wide shapes and initially the teacher will ask the class to show one way of making the body shape very wide. The next stage is to invite the children to discover other ways of solving this task. And through the techniques of stimulation, demonstration and observation, the children find their own varied solutions. Later, these are combined into a pattern or sequence based upon this one idea. Follow Janet in her pattern. Weight bearing on the hands is our next theme. Initially, complete freedom within this limitation allows each child to develop confidence and the ability to support the body weight on the hands alone. The teacher will, however, continue to stimulate as great variety as possible from each individual child. Upside down movement making the feet the highest part of the body, moving over apparatus on the hands, curled and balanced on the hands, wide shapes and bridge-like movements. And just as we can take the weight of the body on the hands, Similarly, we can balance on other small parts of the body, too. Knees, hands, head, toes, elbows, hips and shoulders. Let the children discover these different ways of balancing for themselves. The second part of the lesson is devoted to the use of large apparatus. Successful group work depends upon effective planning and organization maximum use of apparatus and space, and in addition, the opportunity for repetition and consolidation. At least half of the lesson should be devoted to group work. The planning and arrangement of the apparatus is often the most difficult aspect of group work, and this requires special care and consideration. A few points to remember are to determine the number of groups to be used, the amount and type of large apparatus available, and to use such large apparatus as near as possible to where it is normally stored. Perhaps one of the greatest influences for successful group work is the effective training which has been given in the early part of each lesson. The idea of pattern can be developed in this part of the lesson too. And in this case, Sandra creates a pattern of movements by moving from one part of the climbing frame to another. And in her pattern, she shows variation in shape, different upside down movements and hanging positions from different parts of her body.
In group work, the work can be individual. But in addition, partner work becomes possible, and ultimately, cooperation within the group itself. Notice how the group is dispersed over the climbing frame. So not only do we plan to affect dispersal of the same kind of apparatus, but also dispersal of the children within each group. Sometimes it is possible to subdivide a group, thus ensuring maximum opportunity for practice, and queuing is reduced to a minimum. Children of this age enjoy working with a partner. Sandra and Margaret like matching their movements. Cooperation within the group itself can be prompted by the teacher, but the many variations are discovered and combined by the children themselves. They are encouraged to use the pole in different ways, on, over, round, against, sometimes matching their movements simultaneously or in quick succession. The teacher conducts this part of the lesson so that each group moves from one kind of apparatus to the next. But he must be careful to allow sufficient time on any one piece of apparatus to make the practice in that group valuable and worthwhile. It is also important that each child has the opportunity to use every piece of apparatus. One way to ensure both these ends is to move the class clockwise in one lesson and anti-clockwise in the next, so that if the class moves only halfway around in each of two lessons, all apparatus would be used. There must be a degree of continuity in the arrangement of the apparatus in successive lessons. Too frequent changes often restricts progress. Confidence in the use of large apparatus is essential, and this is best obtained through the use of the indirect method of presentation, where the children are free to use the apparatus in a way that suits them. Coaching by means of demonstration, observation, and stimulation will help each child to make maximum use of the apparatus which is available. At a later stage, tasks on the various pieces of apparatus can be imposed upon the class and each child is encouraged to solve the task in as many different ways as possible. The most successful work is achieved when both the indirect and limitation methods of presentation are used. Complete freedom is most unrewarding. The method is devised to give each child a sense of achievement, each individual a sense of adequacy and security. Enjoyment becomes the byproduct of well-chosen well-taught and well-executed work. <laughs>